and welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about ESG, sustainable investing, with somebody who uh, has been on the show once before, but uh, joined by the the better and uh, more senior, more enlightened version of him, too. So we've got uh, Mr. Zach Conway and Michael Conway on the show with uh, Anna uh, also here again today. But uh, everybody, thanks for being here today. Excited about the show, and uh, I am excited to actually you know hear from the person who taught Zach everything so it's a good uh good start here <laughs> good to see you guys there you go <laughs> I, I, yeah I, I you, you know it's uh, <laughs> uh one, one of my best attributes right uh kiss up to the right person in the room right it's uh you gotta know who to uh please so uh, but thanks for joining us uh, here today. Go. It's uh, exciting. I know we've got a, uh, you know, a lot to cover in kind of a, a decent amount of time. But uh, if you could, uh, maybe Michael, I'll start with you. Could you give us kind of the thirty seconds who you are, what you do, and actually, it might be nice even in the start to hear your connection with Carson Coaching because I know we've had a long relationship on that side too. Yeah, yes, thank you, Jamie, for sure. So. I mentioned uh, CEO of Conway Wealth Group. So I have been doing financial planning, I, I jokingly say, for 100 years at this point. So starting in the, in the industry a long time ago, and um, as things have developed, we, we went into detailed financial planning, and, and the whole industry has evolved uh, a great deal. Um, I have been a student of the business and I've loved to pay attention to trends and where things are going and how to improve not only the lives of financial advisors, but how can we improve upon, and the same thing you guys and Ron has always tried to do, how do we improve upon our value proposition for the people that we work for and the people that we represent our clients? Uh, so I, I was a coaching student of Ron's for many, many years. And um, I and Jamie, you know this. I always love to give a shout out to uh, Greg Opitz, who uh, really, really was exceptional for me in coaching and all the, the stuff that Carson does and how, how I could actually take it and implement it. And that's one of the things we think we have done well. Um, and a big piece of this is directionally where we have gone with our business and indeed seeds as the transformation of the industry and our value proposition, if you will, as I just mentioned a second ago, for our clients. So with that, Zach, I'll throw it over to you. Yeah, good to see everybody. So uh, I, when I joined Mike, so I think eight years ago or so, maybe nine years ago at this point in the business. Um, obviously, as we've talked about before, I, I sort of grew up in the business, watched what he was doing and building uh, the organization and how he worked with clients. And then very quickly when I joined, got to experience uh, what Mike just referenced in working with Carson and just having that very clear kind of actionable guidance on how to you know, not only improve the operational efficiencies of the business, which I was very much involved in when I first joined, but then how does that transfer transfer to client experience and the value proposition, you know, that we're trying to uh, deliver. And so, you know, as we've talked about, Seeds very much is an extension of all of those things that we were learning um, and found most valuable and were implementing. And as Mike mentioned, as we've seen sort of the evolution of the space and we talk a lot about, you know, asset management as a value proposition becoming commoditized and that not being sort of the leading edge of what we are, how we're positioning ourselves as advisors. How can we as advisors make investing more engaging? How do we turn it into an experience instead of this transactional uh, part of the business? And so, uh, yeah, as Mike mentioned, you know, our, the, the extension of that thinking is, was manifested in a new business called Seeds, where we can now really more deeply understand our investor clients through that platform, and then again, deliver hopefully more engaging experience around the investment process 
than we were before. So that's that's the idea. Very cool. Yeah, yeah Zach, so since um, we're going to get to the serious stuff, before we do, would you like to dive into some fun questions? And you've already answered this before, so if your tastes have updated or you've gone into some new crazes, so I want you both to tell us about what, what are your favorite foods or your favorite thing around food or just current favorite food trends right now that you're into? I'll just, I'll, I'll give the update, I guess, to my, uh, to my last answer. So I, of course, you know, my answer last time we spoke was, um, basically too many breakfast sandwiches here in New Jersey. And so uh, I've tried to and have been told to dial that back a bit here in the new year uh, for, for the sake of my health. And uh, so anyway, that's that's still the favorite. But, you know, trying to do a little bit better. Uh, we talk about, you know, holistic well-being with our clients. And as as uh, in all of these different areas, trying to make sure we kind of live by our own uh, own advice. And so anyway, still the favorite, but maybe a little bit less than before in terms of consumption. Okay, great. Right. You don't try you to don't swap, try to swap out turkey bacon, bacon or egg whites or try to make it. No, I, I just, just I, cutting back. Just I can't do it. I can't do it that way. It's, okay. it's the cold turkey. Uh, yeah, just kind of, you know, don't go. Don't go into town. I had a, che- I had a and, cheeseburger uh, at 730 I this morning, just in case anyone was wondering. So, yeah, <laughs> that's good. Life took that's things. That's good. That's, that's what the body. That's what the body needs. Jamie, it did. Uh, and leftover day. pop tarts. So that was, uh, you know, just breakfast Lips and champions. Yeah. Just can't get any better than that. <laughs> yeah. Dinner and dessert. Jamie, we're going to have Jamie, we're going to have to get you to talk to the nutritionists we we refer to our clients. Um, I would say um, if my concierge medical team isn't listening, I would go with a Reuben. Um, But Anna, to your point, this morning I had egg whites, salsa and avocado toast. So that that would be... uh, a good uh, morning the, start there's nothing me. better than a good reuben sandwich with the melted cheese and yeah I well, where's your go-to one. reuben <laughs> yeah. place do you have one there's a it was actually it was actually i'm sorry it was um this is kind of crazy but it was outside a small town mm-hmm. i forget the name of the town but south of cody wyoming was this little uh, cowboy diner that yeah, uh, was the best yeah, room I, I've ever a, had? I'll I don't know up. if it's still there. Probably, yeah. I haven't. I don't go into Philly as much as I used to. My wife could probably tell me. But there was Rachel's, which was right downtown by Ridden House. That was a fantastic Reuben place in Philadelphia. And I think that, like, I, I, I probably will look this up as we're on the show. Um, I think that Omaha, Nebraska, oddly enough, like claims. Yeah, so they do. Omaha claims that they created the first Reuben, which was complete news to anyone coming from like the, you know, Philly, New Jersey, New York area. Because you're like, it's definitely a thing over here. Then you show up in Omaha. They're like, yeah, we created the Reuben. And I'm like, but did you? (laughs) like, (laughs) Or did it get there like a good like 70 years later? Then you were like, well, we created this. So I I don't. I (laughs) Yeah, this is us. But it's interesting. So yours this was is def- uh, this you know, is out west too. Well, uh, we'll shift over here. Uh, kind of one more icebreaker question, and then I do want. I've got a specific question about the the starting of seeds, uh, which is, and Mike, we'll go to you on this one first. Uh, which is, what was your first money memory? You know, it's interesting. Um, mm-hmm. You've heard of Simon Sinek start um, his book, Start With The Why. And actually, Greg helped me with this. I actually have a, we have a video on our website that I shot. One of my first money memories is um, the fear of not having it. I remember my dad coming. My dad was um, a dentist. And um, I remember him coming home for lunch to see if patients had sent in checks, right, for billing. He was like a one man shop back in the day. And when money didn't come in, the angst in the household around it. And it was really quite a burning memory. 
And so the Simon Sinek piece of it is for, was for me as I, I didn't start this career as some grand mission because of that. But when I did find this career, I was like, man, I could, I could give myself peace of mind and I can give my clients peace of mind around this whole money conversation. This is really cool. So that did that you work in the dentist analogy. business at all? Like with the bookkeeping eventually, did you help him out with that? No. 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 He was busy I, no, trying I didn't to be at all. You know, a rock star, um, I think, at that point. Yes. That was my. Yes. That, that was my. Out, yeah. That, that <laughs> were, you out, or, uh, were you singing or playing instruments? <laughs> Uh, no, no. I, I thought I was supposed to be a drummer, and Zach we will remember as he was a kid. But I bought this expensive drum set because I was gonna learn how to be a drummer. It turns out, <laughs> wait for it, I'm really bad at drumming. So that that uh, yeah. my, my drum out. kit's back up in the, the basement. Um, sure. One of my one of my kids, uh, Gavin, is is likely. He's very coordinated in general. He's a little bit like me where he probably is pretty close to ambidextrous. So if he probably trains both sides of things, like he'd probably be pretty good, which helps for drumming because you have to actually be pretty coordinated with both. If you're except if you want to be part of Death sure. Leopard, then you can be a one armed drummer. But outside of that, that's about it. <laughs> Well, uh, let's move into uh, this exactly. other piece, which is I do want to know, like you, you obviously took the kind of leap of faith and moved into creating seeds as an actual company and offering an experience. Obviously, you talked about watching trends, seeing where things are going, what's developing. But there's always that moment that, right, like, hey, are we actually going to go do this, right? I mean, you can talk about trends and you could have incorporated that in from a bunch of different places. But tell us, how did you get to the point where you said, you know, we're actually going to go do this and build something, create it versus just go integrate it into what we're doing? Yeah, it's a, um, I'm not sure we have a perfect answer because it we, we just kind of did it, <laughs> it, you know, but well, I, no, I, I have the first part. Well, of it. No, yeah, go for I, it. I have the first part of it. You came into my office. You came into my office and, and said, yeah. we're starting a new business. I would say, that was I would say story. too, the, the real kind of underlying piece of me walking into the office and saying that were those trends and, and the significance of those trends and and our sort of For surprise sure. that they weren't being acknowledged or addressed. And this is now looking back, you know, four and a half years ago or so, or, or maybe five years at this point where we really started to think about it. And, and there's sort of two things, there were two things that we recognized at the same time. One was just this very sudden uptick in demand for not just values-based investment portfolios, but deeper engagement and understanding of what's going on in your portfolios. Like all of a sudden there was this disconnection from, you know, sort of the traditional approach of here's my model portfolio of ETFs. I don't really see what's happening inside of that. And I have my quarterly review and I'm cool with that. So that was kind of the big first trend we recognized. And then the second, which is really the same, was we can't hang our hat on that old approach anymore as advisors. You know, five years ago or so was when everybody was, it was kind of the thick of robo advisors are gonna knock us out of the business, right? We were all gonna get replaced. But we recognized that wasn't about, you know, the consumer wanting just a completely digital experience, it was that they actually just wanted human advisors that engaged them in a deeper way. So it was that trend of, um, uh, you know, deeper, more deeper engagement with what was happening in your portfolio and this commoditization of the other side of the business, the asset management side. So yeah, that, that you know, those, those kind of, bulky trends that we thought we recognized at that point, I guess is why I, that's why I walked into his office that day. It's, 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 and and our client, your client speaks to you, right? You, You begin to hear, you hear something once you hear it again. And as the kids of our wealthy clients would say, Hey, 
we see what you're doing for mom and dad, but but wait a second, how about this whole other space we're hearing about? And um, and then we would go back and look for solutions in the marketplace, and it always ended up where Zach and I would look at each other, and it was like it was a one size fits all. There was, you know, you're you're um, you have a size 10 shoe, but if you're a size eight or a 13, that you're out of luck. Right. It was mutual funds, ETFs, and there was no way to align portfolios with somebody's particular value. So we kept noodling on it, noodling on it like and, and searching for it and, it. and it didn't exist in the industry. So that's kind of I'll, I'll share uh, quickly. Too. To I'm remembering sure. and I, I've shared this before, but quick story that was one of the sort of epiphany moments for, and Mike and I were together at the time when it happened, but we were at a conference and someone was on stage talking about criminal justice reform and just the problems with our prison system. And, you know, there are private prison companies uh, who, who, you know, they're incentivized to put and keep people in prison. That's, that's their business model. And so a room full of, um, you know, New Englanders, standing ovation at the end of this presentation, recognizing all these critical problems with our system. And Mike and I are sort of looking around the room thinking all of these people own those private prison companies in their retirement portfolios and none of them even know it simply because we've just disconnected the engagement, you know, to our money. Um, there's this, there's these layers and layers that, that kind of hide what's actually going on. Um, so anyway, that, that was an actual specific moment as we were recognizing those trends where, wow, if we as the advisor to this room full of people and all our prospects and clients revealed that sort of absurdity and told them you can not have it happen that way and still get the same performance and still reach your financial goals, that would be a differentiator for us compared to the rest of the industry. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was a specific moment for us. So, um, Zach, you talked about identifying the trends and, and you had had posted this article on LinkedIn about the Morningstar research that found that there's the gap between people who say sustainable investing is important and then the people who actually do it and engage in it. We like, did. Like yeah. me, right, Jamie? <laughs> Called me out on an earlier episode this week about that. <laughs> but so, yes. So um, I was curious to hear what you both had to say about that gap and closing that gap and how advisors could productively approach the conversation with folks to tell Tell them that, oh, hey, well, if you're passionate about X, Y, Z cause, you might actually own those in your portfolios. And like, t so tell us about that. First, the research, how, how advisors could kind of approach it more, more or approach it better. Yeah. So so I think that article, you know, was basically saying, uh, as you said, there's a huge chunk of the investor base that would do this if they were empowered to do it. And we always we very often hear from advisors, you know, they say, my clients aren't asking for this. My clients have not come to me to say I need an ESG portfolio, so I'm not delivering them. And we always think of kind of the inherent irony in that, like it's the one area of what we do or what should be part of our job description where we're OK with being reactive. Right. Like I always say. You never want a client to come to you and say, hey, tax laws are changing. What are we doing from a tax planning perspective this year? It's embarrassing if you're in that position as an advisor. And yet, you know, understanding arguably what matters most to your investor clients is this thing that advisors to some extent are OK being passive about. Um, and I think the risk there is exactly what is mentioned in that article. People are finding when people understand that this is a thing you can do, they're going to go do it and you're not going to be the person standing in front of that transition, whether it's the individual client or their kids. If you're not proactive in delivering that solution, you are, you know, it's we always say, too, it's both sides of the coin. There's there's massive risk of attrition if that's your approach and you're missing again back to those trend points, you're missing arguably the biggest paradigm shift in asset management ever. There's trillions of dollars that that are now being fundamentally you know, driven by ESG integration. So from an opportunity capture standpoint, we always try to encourage advisors, if you choose to be proactive, reveal to your prospects that this is a thing they can do, they're going to want to do it. And then you're the hero advisor that's brought that solution to them. 
Um, so yeah, that's. You know, it's you know it's been interesting, you guys, to, for me in this journey. Is I had a limiting belief when I we started this that I thought it was going to be more, as as we bifurcate our world into uh, tribes, right, with Republicans and Democrats. I thought this was going to be maybe a little bit more of a little bit more liberal solution. And that was a limiting belief on my part. And what I found is it's only like three to 5% of people that don't, because the people over here want it for this reason and people on this side want it for it. I've had clients say, well, why wouldn't I want good governance? The, the CEO of McDonald's, I think was, um, the board was trying to get $50 million back from him from things that happened while he was the, why wouldn't we want good corporate governance? Um, so advisors, so leads me to advisors should be speaking to their clients about these things. We have one example where, whoops, we have one example where an advisor had a very large family a uh, 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 client portfolio and hadn't d discussed this, this, this values-based investing at all. And these people have been clients for a long time. The, the daughter of the client asked to take a look at the portfolio and, and kind of saw some of the things in the portfolio that Zach referred to before, whether it was uh, private prisons or oil or, or guns or whatever it might be. And the family ended up going back to the advisor saying, we thought you knew us. So, so shouldn't the advisor be out and being, be, be a leader and talk to your clients, even if it's the 5% that decide not to implement it, that's fine. I love that. But story. have the conversation. It, it reminds me of right. one and I'll, I try sometimes not to bring Ron stories into everything, but this one ties nicely to that, which Ron, uh, you know, when he was building his firm, you know, eventually he ended up like a lot of other advisors and he got overly busy. He had too many clients and he talks about that. So he's like, and then I instituted minimums and I had a minimum amount and I stopped working with certain people and it ended up being a lot of younger people. And then he's like, eventually I ended up losing one of my largest clients because they had kids and grandkids that I wouldn't work with because they were below my minimums, right? And essentially I lost a really good client because I wasn't paying attention to the overall family. And he's like, and I learned then that I can't have minimums, right? That actually I have to, if I want to work with the, right, the head of the household, the millionaires that are the grandparents, I've got to be willing to work with the whole family. And it's a very similar thing on the investing side. Um, I was in a like a pitch meeting, I guess, one time for a, you know, a, a fairly wealthy client. I think they had about 30 million in assets. Um, and I learned two, the two major faux pas occurred in this meeting. One was that uh, I was watching the advisor pitch and they were pitching to the husband the whole time. And probably about three quarters of the way through the meeting, we realized that the husband was not actually the one that was going to make this decision. <laughs> and it was like, they designed this whole pitch. thing. That was where the relationship was too. So like, you know, the advisor knew the husband, they brought the meeting together and I was sitting there and all of a sudden I realized I was like, they, they've been pitching to the wrong person the entire time. <laughs> but, and, and she cared all about like women's rights. And there was all these pitches about investment vehicles and strategies and none of them addressed that. And I remember thinking when I saw a sustainable investing and in ESG kind of uh, technology pitch a couple of months later, I was like, if they had only done that, they would have probably closed that relationship within 20 minutes, not the two hours and five other meetings they had to go back to to repair the relationship. And eventually, right, like if you could have actually just listened to who they are and come in and say, you know what, like this is who you are. We actually heard you. <laughs> right. And here's your solution versus, as you said, kind of imposing our own limiting beliefs out there on somebody. And that's really what was occurring in that. Right. The advisor had limiting beliefs of what how he viewed the world, imposed them onto the situation, and really wasn't meeting them, you know, where they were. It took, you know, it was a lot of wasted time and energy to eventually figure that out. And so I thought that was a really interesting tie together through all of it. <laughs> uh, so not to go too far down the rabbit hole of, of this, but 
I saw a sign recently and I took a picture of it as it relates to communicating with people and with clients in this context. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And that's by George Bernard Shaw. But how many times we're in a conversation, Jamie, to your point in, the, in this situation, we're talking to clients and, oh, yeah, they get us. They get us. They, they don't get. You really have to keep asking probing well, and questions. That, and just, just to so quickly add to that, that, that is, you know, it's product versus people in, in what's primary. And so, Jamie, in that example, it's like, we need to show you how great our product solutions are, why we are the smartest asset managers, and that's why you should pick us, as opposed to the only way to effectively communicate is to shut up, ask the right questions, and understand who that investor is and what matters most to that investor, so then you can deliver the right solution. And so that is, you know, at a very high level, what Seeds tries to accomplish. It's about the product comes way later. You have to understand who your investor is and what matters most to them. So you, in, like in that example, and also it, in terms of kind of breaking the status quo of the industry, understanding the investor has to be multidimensional now. It's not just about risk tolerance and time horizon. If you can do these things by way of your money, we need to understand how you think about that. And so, you know, at the front end in that assessment process, it's really just kind of having that more well-rounded understanding of, of what they're trying to do. If, if I could jump in on that, um, Jamie, so as the old guard here, um, this has been so rewarding as an advisor because, you know, you, you get, um, we do all the planning for sure, but sometimes review sessions can get down to the return in the portfolio. Did we beat, did we not, and all these conversations and the client ends up focusing on a number. To be sure, returns are important. Meeting clients' long-term objectives, that's table stakes. But the rewarding part of it, th there's two books that, that I think are very interesting for the space. Um, one is called Happy Money by Ken Honda. And the other is called The Soul of Money by Lynn Twist. And money has meaning, right? So when we talk to our clients, so the part that's been rewarding is you're going to go through in these reviews and talk about their planning and the performance, but what did your money accomplish? This is the game changer in these conversations, right? As you walk through the different stock positions or bond positions, and maybe why a position was sold because of the shenanigans the company was pulling or whatever it might be, but the client is leaving with a sense of, I'm meeting my objectives and I'm making a difference, right? And so it's, it's rewarding for them. It changes the dynamic of the relationship and it changes the meaning of what their money is doing as they put it out there and put it to work. So that's been really that. pretty I, darn I cool. Have, for, uh, you, for sure. This is, you're not actually going to have the answer to this. It's kind of more of a hypothetical question, but you guys brought it up before. How many people would actually be excited of your clients that they're investing in the prisons? It's one I always, you know, I know that, <laughs> you know, I don't run into a lot of people that I feel like come to me and said, yeah, I really want to make sure that I'm diversified into private prisons. Like, has, has anyone ever come in and asked that? Like, it seems like that's one that, you know, some people might be okay with it just from a diversification and total return and they don't really pay attention, but that might be that 5%. Like I'm guessing here that probably like the vast majority of people are not real interested in investing in private prisons, but probably are. And the key is understanding where they are on that spectrum, right? We, as much as we believe that it's sort of fundamental that people want to express values by way of their money, not everybody is trying to do something hyper thematic or specific. And to what degree are you sort of considering those issues? Do they matter to you in general? And that is 
part of that assessment journey, right? Is that a specific thematic thing that resonates with that person in terms of ensuring divestment from, from a category like that? As advisors, through an experience on a platform, we need to figure that out. So we understand not just what portfolios to implement, but how to talk to those people in the right way. To answer your question, yeah, it's very, <laughs> wherever you are on that spectrum, I would say it is, you know, maybe around that 5% or less who say, I need private prisons in my portfolio because I really believe in that business model. Um, and that's the other piece of it too. This is about materiality, right? It's not just about sort of the warm and fuzzy aspect of, of ESG. We believe and data increasingly suggests that there's a correlation between materiality to shareholder value and the, the quality of sort of the ESG profile of a company. If you're horrible to your workforce, even if you're okay with that from a moral standpoint as an investor, if I'm a pragmatic investor, I'm looking at that fact and considering it in the way I invest. Private prisons is a perfect example, right? Do I really believe in that business model long term? <laughs> um, and so we think we can incorporate those things. And if you can get benchmark like returns and also understand I don't need to empower companies that are putting people in prison, make products that hurt our kids, polluting the planet, terrible to their workforce. That sounds great. And if you as my advisor can deliver that, you know, I'm going to probably not going to fire you. There was also that Wall Street Journal article, um, Zach and Michael, I, I don't know. I know Zach for sure read it and has a response to it. So I wanted to kind of ask your opinion on, you know, call ESG investing a craze. And so I want to hear, talk to us about that and how to dispel some of these myths. And uh, yeah, just tell us about your response piece too, Zach, if you want to <laughs> share on this platform. Uh, yeah, so we were, we were talking before we started that uh, that is very top of mind. We just, we posted something actually today uh, responding to a, a series, a column series uh, through the Wall Street Journal, uh, as you said, calling this this trend a craze. And, and I think what's what's missed is just sort of the rational middle. There's so much happening in this space when there's this much growth, right, and this much sudden demand. There are a lot of inherent problems with how it's being delivered to investors. Greenwashing we talk about all the time is absolutely a thing. Large asset managers have absolutely taken advantage of, of you know, the growing popularity in the space. But there's a rational middle in how do we actually solve those problems and not discount. Right? We even sort of took, took uh, notice of the, the word craze, right? as if it's like you know, beanie baby investing. Uh, but meanwhile, there's millions of investors who have decided, as we were just talking about, if I can just align my fundamental values with my financial goals, I wanna do that, and I'm well informed and can make my you know, appropriate investment decisions, it seems a little disconnected from reality to call that a craze. I would say that's just sort of um, logical. So yes, trying to kind of dissect a lot of what's being said in the industry that is kind of seemingly opposed to this trend playing out, even though it's what investors clearly seek, um, while at the same time, you know, addressing the fair criticism of what's happening in the space and how do we regulate it the right way and make sure things are labeled appropriately and, and you know, increase transparency and in investment processes and all of those things. So we're trying to be thought leaders and kind of um, have that discussion and hopefully move the industry forward. so then let's dive into that Let, give us the kind of explanation of how does seeds particularly fit into moving this forward what's the real solution right uh so when somebody's listening to this they say okay i get it now i get where seeds fits into this overall picture yeah so i'll touch on just a little bit you know what what is the product right how do you actually kind of bring this into your business and so we think of it as a kind of full life cycle client experience platform, because between the advisor and prospects and clients, 
through the platform, we can take people through that upfront assessment process we've, we've been talking about. So in a 30 to 35 minute conversation, what used to be, you know, maybe a blank piece of paper and a pen where we talked about what is your risk tolerance and your time horizon and your, and your financial goals, there's now a digital experience to do that and go deeper to understand who they are as an investor, how do they think about money, and how do they prioritize fundamental values. So that's happening right on the platform. So anybody that sort of now as a user as the platform, anybody that walks in our uh, you know, metaphorical front door, that is the first part of the experience. We're taking them through that assessment process. Then right on the screen, we're capturing, here's who you are. It's not just a number related to your risk profile. It's that, but it's also all of those other things that, we, that I just described. Then on the other side of that. Zach, just, just a quick um, addition there. One of the things the tool can do as well, which can be a marketing piece, but for an existing client or for, for a, a prospective client, is Seeds will assess through the lens of these different categories how well the client's existing portfolio is. How does it score? So the client whose other advisor might say, yeah, you're all set with this. And they look at it and go, wow, no, your portfolio could very well, if it scores negative, have a negative impact on the world. Right. So that upfront assessment as well to objectives. In exactly. The and then and then capturing once that profile is captured next to your current portfolio that may have a few problems with it. Here's where we want to take you. Here's your custom multi-asset class portfolio. That's the manifestation of all those things I was willing to understand about you is still inclusive of financial goals. And then we can implement it and I can show you what that portfolio is then doing from an impact perspective across asset classes. So you're now a shareholder in these companies. Here's what that means. You own this bond exposure. You're supporting, you know, infrastructure builds through your municipal bond exposure in some cases. And so to Mike's point, if we've taken a prospect through that experience to show them, here's your current portfolio with your advisor who never in a million years was going to ask you these questions. And here's where we want to take you because we did ask you those questions. Uh, you can imagine the, the sort of uh, uh, engagement rate at that point is pretty significant to implement. And then full life cycle. Once that portfolio exists and that's the heart of our relationship, as Mike alluded to, that's what we talk about. That screen and experience is now up in front of the client in client reviews. Yes, we're talking about performance and all the other holistic planning that's table stakes in the relationship. But here's this custom allocation that we created together because we know it matters to you. Um, so that's the idea. What's been the biggest hurdle that you've seen when talking to advisors, whether it's, uh, as Mike said before, a limiting belief or otherwise, in trying to get people to move forward with you know, ESG or sustainable investing or seeds? Like, What is the biggest Right. Is it mental? Is it time? What is it that's kind of the slowdown here from somebody moving forward and adopting this more into their practice? Because you you see a lot about it, as you know, assets are flowing there. But I would say it seems to me that the advisory world seems to be slightly behind, whether you call it a, a trend or otherwise. Right. Like they do seem to be trailing, not leading this. Which which is a little bit scary, right? It's one of the only moments, uh, you know, in uh, Jamie, I'm sure you could think of others for sure. But um, one of the only moments where we as professionals are kind of behind the understanding of this space compared to our actual consumers. Um, and I think the, the good news is two years ago, I would have said the answer to that question is the the limiting beliefs around ESG investing as a process and it's going to hurt performance and it's for the hippies and nobody wants it and all, all of those things and fortunately you know the largest asset manager on the planet has you know supported this trend in, in various ways along with many other firms the, the market has kind of dealt with that piece of the issue for for us as a business 
I, I would say probably like you all experience um, sometimes in working with advisors, the biggest challenge is advisors who are comfortable. You know, advisors who have built great practices, they're making money, <laughs> you know, they've, they've maybe solidified their own retirement and they're not, they're not thinking about, hey, that 30 to 50% of my client base who does actually want this, but hasn't asked for it yet. I, so I don't Zach, need, go ahead. Yep. So Zach, you, you, said, you said it before. You, you said, you said it before. Be the what's advisor the that's saying, the, the, what's the average age in our industry? I, I don't know what the number is, but it's too, it's too old, right? And so that average age advisor saying, well, my clients aren't asking for it. Well, that's not leadership. So we need to lead and we need to find solutions for our clients. And by the way, it's a wonderful marketing opportunity for advisors. So in other words, to the the prospect to the prospects out there is your portfolio aligned with your values let's take a look right what a wonderful opportunity and so um i, I think i think it's that you know my clients aren't asking your clients aren't asking about it <laughs> what are you talking about we're leaders in the industry we need to go to our clients and problem solve and give them best possible outcomes because like my other example, when they do figure it out <laughs> and, and the advisor goes, oh, well, yeah, I can get you a solution there. Well, gee, <laughs> right. A little late. So, so how do advisors who like maybe they're wanting to make that transition and start to learn more? What are some good resources that you recommend that are good for for that type of learning and to get to get the basic knowledge and, and the experience? It's a really good question. I would say uh there are so there's so much on the sort of academic side of of that question right what is what is this process what is the evolution of the industry from you know sort of the sri movement decades ago to where we are now um, the investment thesis behind esg integration and how it is a limiter of risk exposure and and, um, and, and sort of all of those in the weeds academic things that's all important, but I also think what we always sort of point out to advisors, um, understand the practice management, all the things we were just talking about, understand the practice management um, opportunities and approaches as it relates to this space. You, you need to be dangerous enough when it comes to the academic issues related to ESG, but we don't but we encourage advisors to not sort of use that, hang their hat on that. I, I, I'm not an ESG expert. I don't understand everything and the, and the mechanics of how this works. Therefore, I can't deliver solutions to my clients. You need to be dangerous, but you need to really understand how do I have this dialogue? How do I engage with the clients? The clients aren't asking for the academic side. They're asking for that engagement process up front. And seeds can support <laughs> and other platforms can support you know, the actual implementation behind the scenes. I'd love to hear from both of you. So if an advisor is listening right now, what's the next step they should take on this? If they're saying, you know what, I'm really not doing it. I have one assumption of myself, which is you should probably look at it for your own investments first, right? Like do that <laughs> and see how you, like, how do you feel about it? It's kind of, I, I pushed on Anna the, the other week because, you know, it's like, well, have you asked about this? She's like, no. And I'm like, do you care about it? Probably. Like if you found out that you're investing in private prisons, you'd probably not be super pumped about that, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I think if you start with that yourself, you could very easily get behind it because you could probably walk away and say, you know what? Like, I feel better about this. My clients are probably going to feel the same way. So I think absolutely that, looking at it yourself, what do you care about in the world? What are you doing with your money already, you know, from a charitable giving standpoint and, and that gut check of, wow, you know, my 401k is essentially taking two steps back with what I'm trying to accomplish with my, my other money. But I, I go back to the practice management piece too. I would say so to, to kind of draw the lens out what am I position? What is, how am I positioning my value proposition? Is it still about the product first 
side of the business where I'm a super smart, you know, stock picker and asset manager? Or how am I in the upfront of the engagement with the pro with my prospects and clients actually understanding what's going to resonate and, and what matters most to them? So that's actually kind of the, how I would think about the starting point is an audit of your your user journey between you and your own clients today. You know, are you still a blank piece of paper? What's what's your risk tolerance? And then coming back two weeks later with a model portfolio of Vanguard ETFs in it. Or to what degree are you sort of delivering this this uh, deeper assessment and uh, engagement experience? And Jamie, to that, I, I would also say, and this is indeed a plug, uh, this comment for seeds, but an advisor that's trying to think to, to your question before, how do I learn the whole space? I would say slow your roll. <laughs> Contact seeds, have a conversation with us, start with the basics, maybe start talking about one client. How do you engage that one client? What is the process? What, how do you position it? How do you take them through the diagnostic? So begin with the end in mind, but start at the beginning and and not you're not going to be an expert in this stuff well uh, uh on day Anna, one, do you want to sure. take us out here i think we're uh, probably time wise looking pretty good yeah sure so the the question we always like to end on because it's such a hopeful note um and zach so i i hope you've you've had some changes in your legacy wishes but we we want to we we want to know what's the impact you want to leave on the profession and in the world You want to take that, Mike? Uh, sure, sure. I can jump in. You know, um, you know the old saying, you throw um, a pebble into the ocean and it makes a little ripple, but then the ripple gets bigger and bigger. I love the idea of the value of money and the meaning of money and forcing these companies to do better and, and not only making a difference in our clients' lives, in our advisors' lives, but imagine a small difference in the world at large between all these different issues. So it's really, you know, it's heartwarming to think the advisor wins, the client who's the most important part of this relationship wins, and maybe we make a difference in the world, right? By not greenwashing, but making sound business decisions and getting good results. I'll, I'll just add, and uh, I, yes, I've touched on you know this before, but I, I, for me, it's it's certainly about sort of the large scale shift of capital. What that could really, you know, that North Star what that really looks like is exciting and definitely helps kind of drive what we do every day. But to me, because, you know, my experience and being an advisor and kind of sitting across from clients is it's about, you know, we just talked about it. Isn't it weird that we don't know what our, our hard earned dollars, what the heck they're doing? Like, isn't that bizarre? <laughs> Right. We know when we take a dollar and go do something specific with it, we've decided to do that and we can see the result of it. And yet the conventional wisdom that we've created over years and years in this space is when I put it in my 401k, something happens, but it's really just turning that dollar into two dollars. So for me, it's about the empowerment. It's sort of like handing the autonomy back to the investor and saying, Here's what's actually going on, and you can point this in the direction you want to point it. And and for advisors, how amazing is that? Could that be for that to be part of your role? Right? There's more transparency. You have autonomy, and I'm the person. I'm that hero that's sort of bringing that to life for you uh, and, and helping you implement it. So that to me is exciting, and you know, and we get to see it every day. Right now, being users of the platform. Showing somebody what they own, Jamie, to your point earlier, is very often very eye-opening. And we've removed the friction for fixing it, right? So th this is bizarre. I didn't know I was doing this with my money. And now we can fix the problem. 
uh, it's it's really fun to be able to do that's that. That's awesome. I think uh, to boil yours down, I, I think I heard that you just want to be a hero, though, right? That's <laughs> that's it. That's it. We you know we wear uh, green capes <laughs> on our. Uh, review media that, calls that, that would that would be funny to do right dress up as your a hero for your uh, review meetings well uh mike and zach that was fantastic anna great as always i appreciate uh, you both a lot you know i always like spending time with you and you know having you part of this larger community and the impact you're having here on the profession with seeds and your, your work with clients so thank you uh, all three of you for being on the framework podcast today and thanks everybody else for listening Thanks for having us.